We are CEOs, executives, educators, and professionals from all sectors of society who support the global expansion of betterment in the world through joy and joyly. I'm your host, Cheryl Lynn, founder of the Chair of Joy Experience. Together, we have developed the World Council of Joy, and our council invites CEOs and innovators from impactful organizations to the Joyly podcast. We showcase how generous, bold, and fully engaged they are in their work and what a culture of joy is to them. Good day, everyone. Cheryl Lynn here in the Joyly Studios. I have another amazing guest, Steve Mariotti, and I cannot wait to share this exciting story with you. First of all, I'm going to start off by reading a tiny little excerpt from a book that he wrote uh, called Goodbye, Homeboy. So let me read the first part because you are just going to get goosebumps like I did. One sunny afternoon in 1982, a young businessman experienced a terrifying mugging in New York City that shook him to his core. Tortured by nightmares about the teens who roughed him up, Steve Mariotti sought counseling. When his therapist suggested he face his fears, Mariotti closed his small import-export business and became a teacher at the city's most notorious school, public school called Boys and Girls High in Bed-Stuy. Welcome, Steve Marietta, to the Joyly stage. How are you today? Wonderful to be here, Cheryl. Thank you. You're welcome. So this that paragraph sparks so many people who got inspired by you over the years. I think the number is 1.2 million that have gone through your programming in Nifty. Is that correct? Yes, 1.2 million graduates who started when they were young people and went through a 60-hour program on how to start a small business. And so I can only imagine, I actually have just just crazy amounts of intuition about how many stories that you have accumulated over the years where you've actually seen people go from trauma to triumph, right? Which is the movie that you're all creating right now. Mm -hmm. So if you could conjure up one of the most amazing stories from one of your students um, that showed the transformation from taking your class to going from trauma to triumph. Is there somebody that comes to mind specifically, Steve? Oh, yeah, there's many. And I try to keep all their stories uh, is to bear witness, uh, to bear witness. I am thinking right now of someone that I I stay in very close contact with. And um, uh, she was one of my first students back in um, 82. And, you know, that was when AIDS was just starting it was the first year, the first death in New York was, I believe, March 26th. Wow. And I had started teaching that month. And she came into my class that um, September up in the South Bronx. Both of her parents had that horrid disease. And over the next month, they got worse and also had severe financial problems, which is one of the great uh, stressors of all time. We've all been there, I think. This is terrible. They come to our class, which was off-site of the regular school, because everybody in the class had had a problem in school, either violating a law or being so disruptive. And so I was a special ed teacher. That was my specialty. People are children that have had a lot of trauma in their lives. And the one area where I have some add some value is to help them think about uh, the future from a business viewpoint. I find starting a business liberates people's minds and takes them out of a hierarchy and has great impact on post-traumatic stress disorder, grief, and can really make a difference in this horrible stress over poverty. So Marisol was actually living alone at the age of 14 and had gotten a very tiny apartment through her social worker who the system was helping her out with food stamps and a really basic living, thank God, uh, otherwise she would have been homeless. But the impact of seeing both parents separately uh, being ravaged by this disease which no one understood back then. I'm old enough to remember. 
and, and it eats me. But it was very terrifying. And once a month, both parents would come to class in the buildings department up on Arthur Avenue, where we had this off-site class. And a lot of that book that you spoke to, Goodbye Homeboys, which was a big seller on um, Amazon. And I had a great uh, co-writer uh, who's been my co-writer for over a decade and has helped me write 47 books for kids on how to start a business. But um, having the parents come there was very difficult for Marisol and frankly, for everybody else because no one was sure how AIDS transmitted back then. And there were all these different theories and everything. And they just barely isolated the virus itself. And I, I never forgot that how, what a hero that young woman was and is. Um, she would hug her mother. She would, she was an Avon uh, salesperson. I got in her that position. She was number one in the Bronx. I'm so proud of her, still am. And uh, uh, so both parents passed away. And, um, uh, and she raised herself from the age of 14 and a half, now is happily married, has raised uh, three children, and uh, has her own business, a cleaning business on the side. And uh, we speak once a week. She's been like, she's been like a daughter that I, I wish I'd always had, and in many ways do. And uh, I'm very proud of her. And I, the resonance, and Cheryl, if I'm talking too much, I apologize, but the, the, the courage of humans, I, I've seen people go through, I've had 18 children that were murdered um, while they were taking a class of mine, not in the classroom, thank heavens, but the next day the tragedy would, you know, be announced or whatever. And I've seen mothers meet with other mothers and, and, and they keep going. People find the, the love of life and some beautiful spiritual connection to go through things that I I just find, you know, I've had to leave so many meetings to pretend to go to the men's room has been my normal excuse. I go to the men's room and and cry uh, because the pain of it is, would be a lot. I can't cry in front of people. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I can't do it. And, but but I'd walk out, and I see two mothers, one mother whose son had, you know, uh, killed the other mother's son, and they'd be hugging. And I, I'd say, how is that possible? But something about human beings, the joy of humanity, and that would just keep going. And I, I just think that's very beautiful. I hope that was helpful. That was very helpful. And it leads me to so many questions. And and just for the sake of this uh, video, I really want you to speak a little bit to love, which is the topic that we're going to be having at the Global Joy Symposium. Yes. So the story, the story you just told me briefly, like I can feel, I don't know what the young lady's name is uh, that you're still friends with today, but she became like a daughter. So to that point, what would you say to America that's sort of missing this vibe, this I have to hurry up and get everything done? <laughs> I've got to go faster. I've got to cut the throat or backstab or do something to get to what I want. What would you say in general to the topic of love? Because you've lived such an incredible life and you know this topic so well. Whenever I start to lose this feeling of love and respect, and really there's no emotion like love when you think of it. It's such a beautiful feeling and, 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 and creates so much good in the world. I, as a tip, I always go to Italy. And when I land in Italy, I, I feel, for whatever reason, I can't figure it out, but I feel different. And the ability to feel the emotion of um, my humanity, I guess, and the power of loving the world we've been given, I happen to be very spiritual. So 
to me, it's, um, I'm just thankful to have been born, to have lived with the people um, that I've met. My friends have been best friends in the world. And I, I was lucky enough to find accidentally uh, work, which is teaching uh, with children that are in poverty, in which I have loved every minute. I've had a career that I never dreaded getting up in the morning. It was always a little upset when I had to go home. <laughs> and so many people don't have that opportunity, and I wish them that. It's a, Love is a powerful, powerful force for good. All right. Excellent. Well, we'll talk some more about that um, on the Global Joy Symposium, December 6th through the 10th. But I am curious, Steve, um, just for this for this uh, interview, what drove you? First of all, I heard you say this great love that you had from your parents. But as you were growing up, as you were getting into teaching, as you were being the driver of many, many people's education, what what piece of that made you get up every morning? And I heard you say joy in there. So if if that's the if that's the ticket, I'm I'm really curious about that. Well, I was fortunate enough to start off as a um, special ed teacher. Special ed just means you're working with kids that have unique paths to follow, and they really are special. <laughs> they uh, often have no sense in a positive way of hierarchy. So they don't view, um, they don't judge you on your SAT scores or where you're going to college or what your parents do. And it's a, it's a, a gift. They have a lot of unique perspectives to bring to a marketplace. And probably within a day, I was able to recognize that because they were so unique. And I've always been taught by my parents and the books I read and, you know, um, actually biblically as well, that each human being is um, created. Each human being has their uh, comparative advantages. Everybody has something that they're good at compared to other people at a point in time and place. And everyone is a given a ability to love and to be loved. I have found my specialty for 40 years, <laughs> it's kind of funny to me, 40 years, wow, um, has been helping people that are poor in resources, not mm -hmm. poor in, in spirit or value, but the hand that they've been dealt as a child, which is has nothing to do with them. It's not like fair or unfair. It's just what it is. But often they will find themselves in really the horrors of very limited resources. So they don't have the money to buy a new um, shirt or sometimes with money to buy dinner. It's severe poverty. It's just horrible. But connecting with um, the love of self, the love of the universe, which is incredible where we, where we exist, mm -hmm. often will enable them to develop a love of helping others. And when that happens, mm -hmm. they automatically become capable of starting a small business. Mm -hmm. And I would just aim for two dollars three dollars a day would be my goal to get all the my children uh in the 80s to sell a dollar for profit a dollar for the cost and a dollar for the uh, uh marketing and uh, over time people from our program all over the world we have programs including legacy programs in over 30 countries of the world and all over this country where we have uh, programs in 17 divisions, which are like counties or what have you. And our partners uh, have programs also all over the world and in, and, uh, uh, in places where we've licensed the program uh, to them. Um, and the, the connection between um, 
uh, uh, loving yourself, loving the uh, relationship to the universe, which I think is really important, can lead to the, the love of others. And uh, a way to express that is to develop a way to help them with their problems, which is what business or entrepreneurship is. Every great entrepreneur that I've had the honor of meeting, I've traveled all over the world to interview people that have been very successful at solving other people's problems. And many times they're really gruff uh, women or gruff men. And, you know, but if you can break through that and talk to them and get to when they were first starting, it's a whole different person. And it's a person that wanted to help others because they they loved humanity. And it's, it's sometimes it's hard and I don't have any tool or method for it. And, you know, I don't know how to do it actually, but it always happens. And um, there's emotion, they show emotion about it. That's what I'm intrigued by, the relationship of being an entrepreneur, and I define it a little differently. I think that we're always in business for ourselves, regardless of what your oh, your, your job happens to be. Yeah. Um, but the ability to do well in a any craft, any career, any vision, I think is related and based on love for others because it's a great way to help other people. Did that make sense? Yes. Very well. it all again? Yeah, let's say it all again. It was so juicy. I just wanted to comment on just one tiny little thing and compliment you. And I don't even know if you're aware. You say you don't know how, but I think it's just because it comes naturally to all of us. It's whether or not we are open to the ability to show ourselves. And that is vulnerability. Like I heard you say, you cry. Like who? just cries, you know, and um, can say it out loud that that was a big part and important part of your life. And your caring for other people brought so much emotion that you were all in, right? You took the dive. You were like, what do I got to do to help? And I think that that's the crux of the, of the entrepreneur, if I'm not mistaken, that might be missing. And that could be the tool, this vulnerability, getting what it is we want in life. Would you agree? I'm fascinated by your sentences and I was hoping you go on and on. I was hoping I was reading a book and just go on. <laughs> um, I to totally agree. What what I want to add, um, which I think is important, is I um, did not come to this uh, naturally. I actually had a, in fact, it's in the next pages in the book you were reading. Goodbye, mm -hmm. homeboy. <laughs> I had an incident which really embarrassed me. I got mugged in um, 81 on the um, FDR Drive in New York City. <laughs> I love New York City. I, I don't live there anymore. I live in Princeton. But I, I lived there 38 years. And it was, <laughs> I mean, even when I see it or say it, I get chills in my, because everybody's there for a vision, a dream, oh. the city of dreamers, you know. Yeah. But I had a bad experience in a crime wave. It was in front of my girlfriend, who I felt loved toward. And for a very young man, uh, probably uh, 13, 14, but about my size, I've always been uh, uh, short and, and proud of it. Yeah. But um, I, they mugged us. And I slipped and I fell and I cried. I've, I've never cried in front of people before because mm. I'm so upset. And my, my girlfriend, uh, he, even though it was a little dangerous, they had these little uh, tools, but it was more like a, a pointed, something that, you know, could really hurt. Um, and she, <laughs> she was a teacher at that time mm -hmm. and she commanded them. I leave them alone and get out of here and pretended to um, kick one of them in the tushy. She actually didn't. And he looked at her in shock, thinking, wait a minute, who's this person, you know? And, and But it worked. And they ran away. 
and she helped me out. And, um, but I had, after that, these constant flashbacks to the moment when I fell and our frustration uh, started to cry. And it could have been perceived as I was crying because for any reason, right, that I was scared, which I was. Now it wouldn't bother me, but back then it was for, and I think men, for some reason, tragically, have more of an issue with the feeling of of expressing um, shame. And if you can't express it, you can't get rid of it. And I was locked into that for a while, and it was horrible. I lost the girlfriend <laughs> after my own, you know, yeah. uh, decision making because I felt embarrassed. Yeah. And I went to this guy who's very famous uh, then, and I hope he always is famous, and he's, I'm sure, up in heaven, I'll wave to him, Albert Ellis, and he had developed rational emotive therapy. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, mm -hmm. but um, he he basically argued change your feelings based on your thinking, and um, it... Um, worked for me. I walked in. I said, I can't get these thoughts out of my mind. And he said, ah, that's such a boring case. All right, let's go to the blackboard. And he had me write down what was bothering me. I feel ashamed that I could not protect my girlfriend from four 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds, and in front of 300 people playing soccer, broad daylight. And I, I, I feel that it was my fault. And he, he yawns, he goes, oh God, this is too easy. And he changes the sentence where I am my hero because upon being mugged by four armed men, no one was injured and uh, no property was damaged or lost or theft. And everybody went their own way. <laughs> and so I had to write that 500 times. <laughs> and so it went into my brain. And the other sentence I've never thought of before. So I've always thought of that experience in a different way. And I was freed. <laughs> yeah. And, yes. And Beautiful. Uh-huh. It's a, and everybody should know that work because you know our veterans in particular are committing suicide at the rate of of 22 a day i think it's actually higher now yeah and it's all from post-traumatic stress disorder yeah but there's actually a cure to it which is based on um on albert ellis's work and i just hope that any anybody who's had a trauma uh that is reoccurrent in their mind there's a way to defeat it. And he made me go teach in schools that are very, uh, having a lot of problems in New York. So I'd have daily exposure, he called it flooding, to children that were feeling so much pain that the way they expressed it was by embarrassing or mugging somebody else. Pain cannot stay in a human being's body, it's not normal. And it comes, expresses itself in a lot of different ways. Um, uh, verbal abuse, physical abuse, um, yes. self-abuse, suicide, uh, excessive drinking, etc. That's all the tanglewood of pain yes. versus self-love. Yes. Thank you for sharing that story. And there's, there's a lot of meat and potatoes in there, if you will. Let's, um, let's because this is a, this is a segment for our uh clients and customers and audience to get to know you better. I just want to end with uh, the trauma to triumph. Well, first of all, I think that they should make a movie about you because if there is a, if there hasn't been a story written or a movie produced about Steve Mariotti and how you've gone from trauma to triumph, that that has to be written. And, so, and second of all, so if maybe you could comment on that and then also just really briefly, because I just had Harold and Nan Klein on the show, if you could just kind of give people a tease to go watch um, the documentary that you just produced. <laughs> oh man, I remember 
I hear Nan and Harold Klein, they've been my friends for 32 years and have, I can't even talk about the love I feel for their family and their four boys and uh, the support. They've always been there for me. And they were there for me on this film, which I started a documentary with the question uh, 12 years ago now, I was in Cambodia and I went to visit the killing fields, which are just horrible. Um, it's an anti antithesis of, of love, really, is what happened um, in that um, genocide. Three million people were killed without bullets in 26 months. My uh, friend, who was giving me a tour, and I was on a speaking engagement for the State Department, uh, 22 talks in seven days. It was a lot. I was glad I did it, but found a tooth, a human tooth, at one of the killing fields. And um, this is where the Khmer Rouge or the, the Communist Party of Cambodia had taken over on April 21st, 1975, overcome January 6th, 1979. So 26 months of just killing people who were educated or property. And it was terrible. And a whole bunch of Americans and Australians were sitting in front of the shrine, which was filled of skulls, and where the skull is bashed in in the back, which is how they killed uh, three million people. And they were all weeping. And these are, are like a grown men, grown women. One of them, the uh, woman was a, a police officer from Australia, New Zealand, or what have you. Uh, one of the men was a head of a fire department and they were weeping from pain uh, if, at the realization of this, uh, because you can read all about it, but until you're there, you know, it's like the Holocaust, until you see it, it doesn't really go into you. And I had the exact same feeling of incredible dismay and pain of how human beings could do this uh, to others. So I started this quest of what, what happens to the entrepreneur, the small business person during times of genocide, a war or disease and raise the money and um, got uh, I've worked on it five years and, and he couldn't really uh, get the story right or the filming, had a lot of issues. Um, and I realized I, what, I didn't really know what I was doing. And thank heavens, I realized that. And then I called my, my friend of, of back then 27 years, one of the best friends I've ever had, Harold, and his wife, Nian, I think of them as equal friends, and said, can you come down and help me, please? And they did. They came down the next day uh, from uh, where they, they uh, live, outside of New York, and um, came down to Princeton with, with a film crew. <laughs> and they took over the project, thank oh my gosh. heavens, and they poured their life and soul into it. They saw the value of it immediately. And they they worked on it and they made it into a powerful documentary, which we opened, thanks to them, opened at 11 uh, festivals. And then we're lucky enough to open last uh, two weeks ago Sunday at the 92nd Street Y in New York City. And this November, will be, I believe, on over 50 of the PBS channels. And I think that's dramatically growing. And Harold and Klein, uh, Harold and Klein, Harold and Nan Klein are not only friends, but yeah. I, I love their work. Uh, I Complete. love working with them. Complete yeah. visionaries, complete visionaries. They really saw it. I, as I said, I just hung out. I just had them on the studio not too long ago. <laughs> and, and, 
And what they're saying is the after the show, like I watch Bill and Sam, I haven't watched the female version yet, but the women about the women, but they were saying the real impact is in the conversation with uh, maybe right. Sam's children. And, and to see that unveiling of what even they didn't know. And the, the one uh, woman in the show, she revealed something that no one knew, right? That mm -hmm. Nat was able to hear. So I think that the rollout of this film is going to be around for a very long time, Steve. And thank you for starting this. This is your legacy. And uh, you are an amazing human being. Unbelievable. Cheryl, thank you. I, <laughs> I really appreciate that. And I can't wait for our Global Joy Symposium. So, I have a pronunciation problem. I'm really sorry. No, you said it perfectly. All right. Yay. Yes. All right. We'll see Steve again uh, very soon. And uh, we're super excited that he, he was able to join us today. And um, please go out and watch the uh, documentary Trauma to Triumph that was inspired by Steve Mariotti. Um, it's uh, just Google it. You can find it on PBS. It's uh, available. Just you have to look for it a little bit, but it's out there. So I developed this practice called the Chair of Joy Experience. So I'm going to take you through it very quickly. My first question for you is you're looking around your house. You're in your house right now. Am I right? Yes. If you could go to a specific room that gives you a great amount of joy, I want you to identify a chair in that room or another room that you love to sit in. Which chair is that? It's right where I am now. Is it your office chair? Yes. I, I like it here. Your office chair. It gives you a lot of joy, I can tell. Yeah. Can you get quiet in this chair or is the computer yeah. always buzzing? No, I turn the computer off. Off. Okay. Well, not Wait. now. Right. Oh. <laughs> that would be a great movie to see. <laughs> Come you know, back. Odd guy comes on the show and if you goodbye, Joy. I, 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 I meditate in my chair. Okay, good. Um, good. I did, you did. Uh, I'm happy. All right. So here we are in our chair of joy. And I'm asking everyone that's listening to do to please find your chair of joy in your house. So the idea is if we can focus on joy, like we were talking about earlier, what's the possibility of more success, more outcome, more success and entrepreneurialism, entrepreneurialism as well. Um, yes, we get to feel all the emotions, negative ones and positives. There's 17 different levels of consciousness we can weave in and out of the day from shame to guilt to fear to courage to you know, to uh, gratitude, love, joy, it goes on and on. But the idea is joy is just one of them and we can use joy to fuel the negative emotions so we can get to what it is that we wanna do faster and have more success and outcome. So here we are in your chair of joy, your feet are on the ground and I'm gonna ask you to take a deep breath and I say ocean breath. So six seconds in, two, three, four, five, six and exhale for six, one, two, three, four, five, six. And I want you to see that just starts the relaxation period. If you could tell me one thing in your room right now that you can see, I want you to tell me what you can see physically. What do you see? You don't have to, this is not necessarily a closed eye experience, but is there a trophy over there or what do you see? I'm a rare book collector. I have 18,000 books. 300 are rare. And um, I have a first edition um, double helix it's right in front of me. which is my favorite book. That's so amazing. Can I come and, visit someday? What a, that's like you, a museum. You, if you, you, you come anytime. But this is a rare book collector's heaven. <laughs> Love it. All right. Next question is, what can you hear when you're sitting in your chair of joy? I actually, I live in a small town. And mm -hmm. so I know all the noises. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a student of noise. having been a special ed teacher for so long. I kind of got used to it and what different noises mean. And I love noise sound. Right. So I, I hear my neighborhood um, getting up a little late. I can hear my mailman. So if you're listening again, what we what Steve did is he put his feet on the ground. He took a deep breath. He started relaxing. He started telling me about all the sounds that he knows on a daily basis from his neighborhood. And if you're sitting in your chair of joy and you're hearing, hearing children or hon honking, honking or sirens or something going on, it's cool. Like embrace it. It's just part of your human life. It's your condition, um, your human condition that you're choosing. And so just let them roll through you and uh, and enjoy them. And then whatever you see, 18,000 books, my 
goodness, how can you not enjoy that? All right, one more time. Deep breath in. This is an ocean wave, six seconds in. And Steve, I want you to see if you can tap into one of your most joyful memories ever, the one that just gives you goosebumps, maybe one that we haven't told already. Um, and it can be anything from when you were a little guy all the way up till this morning, if you'd like. What's the first thing that you tap into? Your moment of joy. The first moment of joy for me was I grew up in Flint, Michigan, which I love and very loyal to. Um, and um, when I was a kid, I had the best friend who was my age, but he was a, be a better leader and he was smarter in in business and and we we couldn't get jobs because the wage rates were so high. So for years we would start businesses and he was always the leader. He was incredibly kind to me. His name was Gary, Gary Boyd. And um, uh, sadly he's passed away this past year. And I, I know he's in a better place. I know he's cheering for me and everybody else, but he would always get the business up and running and I'd be the number two guy. And then he'd start a new business and say, you're in charge. <laughs> and the first time he did that, it was with a paper route. And I was so frightened of, of messing up. I can't tell you. I couldn't sleep. And the day was a huge success. All the papers were on time. I collected all the money. And I came to him and I said, here, here's what I did. And he said, that's all yours. <laughs> He'd given me the business out of pure generosity. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and and what was his first name? His first name was Gary. Gary. His last awesome. name was Voigt, V-O-I-G-H-T. Well, that's okay. And he ended up a CEO of a Fortune uh, 300 company. Oh, my gosh. He, he, he was that kind of person who is it's not the person I've always wanted uh, uh, to be who w was uh, a teacher and generous a uh, generous uh, and and never um, vindictive or malicious or or or, or rude um, and he would teach me all these businesses and then and then I give them to me except the second one. And he said, that's all yours, except 10%, which goes to um, McLaren Hospital, the ward for children that are ill. And that taught me the importance of something that I hadn't really learned, the importance of charity. And from that moment on, without seeing what he gave me in business, we, I, I would go, and 20%, I'd always, I'd always okay. beat him to the punch, mm -hmm. goes to, and we had nine different charities in wow. the small town of Flint, Michigan. That's insane. <laughs> what a beautiful story. All right, we're going to keep going just because I want to get through the Chair of Joy experience that's been to, uh, you know, 37 cities and a thousand people. So this chair is getting famous in the world and you're number uh, 1,001 today. So if you could... One more deep breath in. So I want you to take another deep breath. And Gary was an awesome one. I just want you to let Gary's memory kind of resonate from your head to your toe and see him and feel him and just be grateful for all his amazingness. And then I want you to take one more deep breath in and come to another moment of joy. So maybe a more recent one or this morning or whatever success, maybe joyful moment comes up. What is that one? Number two. Um, number two is a big one. Uh, a student of mine uh -huh. wanted to uh, buy a restaurant in uh, Brooklyn on Myrtle Avenue, um, 79 Myrtle Avenue. And uh, I went to see it with him over a decade ago. And the neighborhood looked un under-resourced. It looked, you know, th there's a lot of pain there. And most of the time through no fault of the people that live there, they're just, you know, sure. that's what happened. 
And I said, I don't know. It, I'm a little worried about the uh, danger issues, security issues. Um, and um, he looked at me and he said, I, I, I know this is the place that I should be. And I, and I looked at him and I said, I trust you in your judgment. And I, I believe in you. So then you should do it. And he did it. And two and a half years, I went back and he invited me back and he had purchased two of the buildings. The restaurant was a huge success. He had the longest um, bar in New York City. So people would come just to see that. All right. And back to the chair of joy experience. So people are sitting in their chair, they're listening, they're hearing, they're telling me two amazing stories, which you told me one about Gary um, and the paper route and all the gifts of, of generosity from him and Malik, who you helped, uh, I'm guessing, guide and mentor through the restaurant experience. So just let both of those memories sort of resonate from your Hadir Tal. And if you could give me one word, Steve, one word that describes the essence of those two memories between Malik and uh, Gary, what would the one word be for those memories? Passion. Oh, I love it. And if you could put passion in a container, a physical container, what would the container be? Universe. The universe. And you and me are going on a trip and we're going to go to... Uh, Let's go to Texas. I haven't taken anyone to Texas yet. Usually it's LaGuardia or Bali or Norway or something. I, I don't Texas. know. Texas for whatever reason. I don't know why I picked Texas. And uh, we're getting off the airplane in Dallas and there's 10,000 people there. And you have your uh, universe, your global carrier of whatever kind that looks like filled with this passion, filled with this joy. And they don't get it. They don't understand how you can have the passion and joy. What would you say to them about how to get what it is in your container? I'd hold up one of my favorite books, To Kill a Mockingbird, which captures love, courage, values, integrity, and I would, I would say, I'm almost done reading. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> That's an old classic. I love that. So if you could give this passionate uh, universe a way to someone today to, to assist another, who would that be and why? Oh, wow. I would get without, I think because we're in Dallas right now, I would give it to my friend, of 50 years who lives there, Greg Hall. He, his kindness to me from the age of 18 to 25, he was the most successful entrepreneur that ever came out of South Southeast Michigan in my lifetime. And mm -hmm. by the age of 20, he owned this magnificent, um, uh, uh, that housed 1,200 people, um, apartment complex that had tragically gone bankrupt, had closed, no one could live there. He renovated it, bought a bank to back him, and it was Lemon Tree. And he'd also done the same thing in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where um, I went to school. And I, I would always live in his apartments, complexes. And I went up to him when I was in graduate school and introduced myself and, and told him you're my role model and hero and, and we've been best friends since then he moved to Dallas bought 10% uh, of Dallas Cowboys and has one of the great um, business careers ever if people Google know him. and he's also a writer and in one of his books he comes visits me and he puts me in the first chapter I was so, I was so touched. If you could take a magic wand of joy, if I gave it to you right now, and you could address one issue in the world, what would it be? Or all um, issues? I, I, I would actually address um, economic illiteracy. Okay. I think not knowing um, concepts like opportunity cost, scarcity, risk and reward, 
Um, and the ability to look at opportunities that help other people and decide to the one that's right for you and make it legal through a for-profit or non-profit, it, it is life-changing. I've seen it thousands of times. It, Thank you for sharing that. Thank you're you. You're welcome. And that, that kind of puts a period at the end of the chair of joy experience. Right. Well, the idea, I, the idea behind the chair of joy is really no one takes time to sit down in their chair of joy because they're going so fast. Ah, right. So ah, that so even oh, though you're, no. yeah, no, even no. though you're there, a lot of people have to get away from their computer to go sit so down. It's intellectual. It's purely intellectual. So give their time, give their body a time to get peaceful, to meditate, yes, to, still, to raise that's, the vibration. Of going. I understand. <laughs> so what if the whole world, Steve, I'm just curious from your global perspective, if the mm -hmm. whole world took their time to sit in their chair of joy three times a day and focus on the things that brought them joy, the love, how they got there, friends, relationships, family, what, what do you think the world would be like if we did that? A better place. But what a pleasure to have you and to know you and um, yes. to have to be part of the Global Joy Symposium. So I think this Me is the too. beginning of a long, successful friendship. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.